1946, a new armory was built. The guard unit was mustered in in June, and they went to camp that year. I wasn't with them. I was in business here. And, uh, that was in 36. 1936. So in January of 1937, I joined the guards with the patients so that I could, <coughs> when we went to camp, come back in the evening after training period and to take care of my business. What business were you in? Refrigeration, heating, electrical, electrical contracting mostly. And we trained from 36 to the latter part of 40 two weeks a year and four nights a month. Each Monday night was our training period. However, that was all local in the Army except the two weeks down in camp. We got uh, the second year, we got uh, two M2, A2 tanks down there, and that's the most tanks we had all through those years of uh, Minnesota active duty and inactive duty training. Did you always train in this area? Yes. We never went out of the area. However, it had been marvelous if we could have got into some jungle areas for training. Now, we had Camp Ripley. At that time, it wasn't very large, so you couldn't carry on too much of a maneuver down there. But I would say that the company was pretty well trained at the time we mobilized. What was your what was your job? Uh? My job here as an enlisted man, I was staff sergeant, uh, maintenance uh, sergeant. We mobilized and were activated into federal duties sometime the first or second week of 1941. And we stayed here till the last of February, or last of March, <laughs> last of January. I'll get it straight. And then we shipped out to Fort Lewis, Washington. The night we left down here, it was running 40 below. <laughs> 1941, those are the cold winters. Anyway, we arrived in Fort Lewis, Washington, where we were joined by C Company of Salinas, California, B Company of St. Joe, Missouri, each of them having two tanks apiece. Then I went into transportation there. I received my officer's uh, promotion. I had been on the 10 series course before the war. They had a 10 series course that you took, and I didn't get on it fast enough to finish it before we left here. So we took a brief course out in Fort Lewis, Washington. Quite a number of us uh, in the sergeant capacity were promoted to lieutenants. And then August the third, <coughs> first of August, we were ordered to ship out overseas, you know. And of course, the usual rigmarole destination of no one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we left about the 1st of September for San Francisco and shipped out on the 8th of September. I think we're 17 days in route by sea. That was a long time. Was um Looking back, do you think the training that you had uh, at uh, at Fort Lewis was worth very much to you in the long run? What was it—a realistic and a useful kind of training for you? Uh, I feel that it, outside of perhaps battalion maintenance, transportation, and so forth, there we lacked the equipment. In Fort Lewis, Washington, we had those six tanks from three companies. So, real maneuvers and so forth, we had to substitute with trucks and so on and so forth, these tanks, you know. Uh, but still, the training was pretty good throughout the organization. By that time, it was a battalion of mm -hmm. three companies of tanks, and then we 
selected the men out of the various companies to come in the headquarters. Did you have the feeling that, that you, um, when you left, were you fairly confident about the proficiency of your unit? Did you feel you were a pretty good, pretty good bunch? I felt that we could uh, handle whatever came along, let's put it that way. Uh, we weren't the best, however, Miller said that he was given a rating of the best armored force National Guard unit or entire, I don't think it would be the entire armored force mm -hmm. unit. Of course, we didn't have a very big armored force unit back in those days. Because when we shipped over, <coughs> I was told that, uh, well, I think Miller was the one that told me when he got his orders, that also a letter accompanied that in which we had stripped Fort Knox of all the new and latest tanks there and also down at the Rock Island Arsenal. That was 54 tanks that we got in our battalion. And that's why the question comes up here now as to whether this British Stuart tank was the one we had in the Philippines. I do read, remember reading an article about the Roosevelt and Churchill, where in the early part of the war, Churchill was begging Roosevelt to buy tanks from England because he needed to put his people to work over there. I guess they didn't, uh, they had a high rate of unemployment. You recall that was the height of the Depression all through the 30s there, and of course there was a lot of unemployed people. Anyway, there wasn't much activity, I don't say real activity, until we hit the Philippines. <coughs> we arrived in the Philippines, I think it was the 26th of September, and loaded the tanks off of the ship. Well, when we went to load them, in fact, we could get all but 19 tanks on the ship in the holes down below. The lower hole, the ceiling was too shallow, so we had to move the uh, turrets off the 19 tanks. Is this the one they called the May West? No, this it was twin the twin turrets, or was this? Well, that that was the early M2A2. Was the if they called it May West, I never heard it dressed that way, but it probably was. It was armed merely with machine guns. There was no heavy armament on it and most of it was half-inch armor. And we got rid of them at Fort Lewis and got the M3 tank, which was the two-inch armor plating in the front. And I think on the tour, and about an inch and a half armor plate on the sides. Then the back was a little on the thin order where the engine compartment. But anyway, our orders were to load on that ship, prepared to come off fighting. Ammunition, gasoline, oil, batteries, everything. <laughs> we got them all on there, except the 19 tanks we had to remove the turrets on, and then the captain come down and ordered us to captain the ship, see, in their law. Came down and ordered us to remove all the gasoline, oil, batteries out of the tanks and ammunition. So that was a useless waste of time. <coughs> it had taken us a week to get off of there in a condition to come off fighting. In fact, there was no facilities there. We absolutely couldn't have came off fighting. Unless they'd had the barges and things to take us into shore on some place beside the docks in Manila because they'd undoubtedly been all left out. You understand what I'm getting at? Anyway, we arrived there around the 26th of uh, September. They, we unloaded the tanks on the dock and then I went after aviation gasoline, which was an important part of the tank the aviation gasoline because we had a continental seven-cylinder airplane engine in there. Quartermaster didn't have any. Air Corps was the only place to go and I went down to the Air Corps and he said no way could we get any aviation gasoline from 
<laughs> so I took it back to headquarters and the supply officer there was Lieutenant Quinn fiddled around there for about Oh, it was a good two weeks. Get the orders through into Washington and back out to the Air Corps to turn over so much aviation gasoline for us. But this time, you know, it was the middle of October. Before we even got the tanks off of the dock down in Manila. Then we brought them out to uh, uh, the airport, Clark Field. And from there on, the middle of October, we trained till about the last week in November. <clears throat> Here's something that so many people don't know about, the fact that the Japanese were already making a reconnaissance runs over the Philippines. Have you been told that before? Our planes, our fighter planes, were going up escorting them off, but they didn't dare shoot them down. So they had pictures of every part of Clark Field, and I don't know how many other military installations in the Philippines, but they were there. The last week of November, we were ordered to go on full alert. We moved the tanks out around, the, excuse me, we moved the tanks around Clark Field, or, yeah, Clark Airbus. That was to prevent the anticipated paratroopers to be coming in to take the airfields over. Well, there was never any paratroopers came in there. But at the time, when we went on full alert, the word came down that the Navy had lost the Japanese fleet. So they thought they were up to some trickery. <coughs> but you see, we knew well before we got into that war that Japan was preparing for what they actually did, but they didn't know when. We didn't have enough intelligence on that. One week before the 1st of December, then the order came down to stand half alert. So we stayed there half alert. The morning that the Pearl Harbor was hit, <coughs> we had uh, between 37 and 39 B-17s that had been in, oh, I'd say a month before that, and they had revetments built on the airfield for all of these 17s. I don't know the actual count of the P-40s that was over there, but they were lined up almost wingtip to wingtip on Clark Field. That's how many were there. On the morning December the 8th in the Philippines, it was the 7th back here yet. I think there's about a 50 hour uh, time lag between Honolulu and the Philippines. Do you know for sure? No, I don't. I did know, but I've forgotten it. Anyhow, I was up dressing in my room there, and I snapped my radio on, and I heard him talking about Pearl Harbor. Now, mind you, this is somewhere around 15 hours later after Pearl Harbor was actually hit. Shook my head a little bit, and I thought, that must be an Orson Welles program. I was still fresh in my mind, you know, mm -hmm, because sure. just before the war broke out, Orson Welles <laughs> came out with that. And I stood there, and I listened to it a little bit. Then a special announcement come on and said, Congress had declared war against Japan and Germany. Now this is, in round figures, about 15 hours. It was in the morning over there in the Philippines. So I went on over to the officer's mess and walked in there and there didn't seem to be any concern. I thought it's funny we hadn't been alerted. And I announced that uh, Congress had declared the war. They said, you're kidding. I said, no, that's a fact. Turn the radio on up there. And they turned the radio on, and here they were talking about it. We never really got any orders out there in battalion headquarters on anything, except to remain on half alert, and half alert they were. But the, uh, I think the crews all went back out to their tanks around the airfield 
after they had eaten and assembled and checked off, and they went back. Uh, recalling back there, we got an air aid siren alert about 8 o'clock in the morning then. All the P-40s took off. The B-17s came out of their abutments. They were loaded with 500-pound bombs because I talked to a number of the airmen afterwards about that deal. They took off and they were up in the air. 11 o'clock they began to come in because they were running short on fuel. And I understand that the order come down from the headquarters in Manila and maybe from Washington that we weren't, they weren't to strike until they were hit first. That is, they were loaded to take off for, for mostly, you know. <clears throat> so they couldn't. They never did. <laughs> High noon. In come this beautiful flight of what we thought was Navy planes coming in. I don't remember how many there was in there. We still thought they were Navy planes <clears throat> until uh, we heard the bombs whistling down right on Clark Field. Then the anti aircraft, 200 Coast Artillery from uh, New Mexico, opened up on them. And of course, I had previously talked with the boys in the 200 Coast Artillery. They couldn't fire their anti-aircraft, I think they were all 75 MMs, for fear of scaring the Filipinos. That was MacArthur's orders or somewhere in the Philippines. I won't blame it all on MacArthur, but they didn't, never fired a shot. We had to put inserts in our 37 millimeters to shoot 22s for target practice. <laughs> Anyway, they hit that field. One bomb landed squarely in the officer's mess, and they were in there eating. And I don't know how many of the officers, the pilots, were killed. Man. But the planes were badly damaged with the bombs that fell there because there was a lot of Betty bombers up there. They cleared the field. I watched for the anti-aircraft fire, and I didn't see anything up there in the air, and I thought, Jesus, what's wrong here? I looked back about five miles, there was the anti-aircraft burst, and probably 5,000 feet to uh, that, because they didn't get to do any target practice over there at all. Uh, shortly after the 17, or the Betty bombers passed over, in come the shipboard fighters. Zeros. I think they worked the field over for an hour and a half there. Just kept coming thick as mosquitoes. There was three of the B-17s <coughs> that did get off of the field that weren't damaged in the in between the time that the big bombers came over and the fighters came in. But uh, it was one hell of a mess, caught completely with our pants down. What were you doing at this time? I had the maintenance uh, outfit just to the east of the air, north of the airport, yeah, north of the airport. We're just far enough out, I'd say, that we weren't more than 200 yards out, but we didn't get any bomb hits in there. We got that on the following But Wednesday. you were sitting there helplessly just watching all this going on. Oh, yes. Nothing I could do about it. I stayed pretty close to a big tree. <laughs> <laughs> In case. Because those zeros are coming right down the runway toward us, you know. But they seemed to quit firing when they got at the end of the runway. So, But I still didn't know. My entire platoon was in there. And we didn't know what the hell was going to happen. So then, uh, let's see where they Oh, after it was all over, they called me to move the prime, our prime mover. We had a 10 ton prime mover for the tanks, you know. Called me to move the prime mover in there on the airport. 
and start getting the P-40s off of the runway that we're trying to get off and we're getting... So is this like a big cat or something, or...? No, it's a great big truck, biggest thing great you big get truck. a hold of. <laughs> it would lift the tanks almost bodily out of mud holes <coughs> or ruts or wherever they might got stuck or tow them in for repair. And of course it was big enough to handle the ships, you know, the D-40s especially, not the 17s. In one of those ships, I recall that we moved over to, and I got off and crawled on the wings. Look, here's the pilots that they burned to a crisp right in the plane. You'd hit a bomb hole, and his plane exploded. Could be the Jap Zeros got him afterwards, or got him after he went down in the bomb hole. And but he'd have had plenty of time unless it uh, knocked him unconscious when he dropped in there because it took the landing gear right off and everything. I think, uh, if I recall right, we pulled about 10, maybe 15 fighter planes off of the runway. And of course, that left it for the engineers to come in and get the runway in operation, but it wasn't a hell of a lot of good because we didn't have any planes to speak of. Two B-40s, three or four B-17s. Captain Kelly was one of the planes that got off. You probably read about that in history or somewhere along the line. Captain Kelly's the pilot of that plane. He got off with his B-17. And it seems to me like he sunk one of the damp ships up in Lingayen Gulf. And. Uh, then on his way back to the field, I believe the plane exploded or he was shot down by a zero. I never did get the full story nor find out all the facts about that. Anyway, we moved uh, from the position out by the airport. I moved battalion maintenance back under some trees not too far from our barracks. These were the big mango trees, you know, which give you a lot of cover, but you had a lot of clearance underneath them. I recall that Wednesday, Tuesday, I saw this Jap reconnaissance plane up there again circling around. And I wondered at the time if perhaps we wouldn't be getting them. Wednesday morning I came in, they passed over Clark Field. Broke out of the clouds right over uh, us. <coughs> of course, they had the machine gun positions all set up around there, you know. And we started to fire at them. They were about 800 foot high. That's all they were because they had to come down and get the little <coughs> clouds. That's when they opened their bomb bay doors, <laughs> spilt all their bombs out on us. <laughs> you know, they didn't hit one vehicle. They got my Jeep in the front wheel with the bomb. I had a uh, foxhole over here, my sergeant, uh, Red Schultz, from his, was my driver. We come up there, jumped out of that when we saw those planes or heard them. And they opened the bombs. This bomb hit on the other side of the Jeep. We were over on this side. The Jeep blew the front wheel off of the bomb and the radiator would knocked it out. Hot dirt came in over uh, on us in the hole. But I followed that bomb right from the bomb bay down. That's how low they were. And I thought, hell, looks like we had it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, our next move then out of Clark Field, because it had already begun to be abandoned. There was no Air Force left. We moved down to Lake... Uh, God, I wish I often wish I had a map of the Philippines. The big lake down below Manila there. And we were down there one day and then we had the order to move back to Lingayam Gulf. And I think we detached C Company of our battalion to go on down to repel an invasion that's coming in on the southern part of Luzon and A Company went on up. You understand, we only had two companies of the battalion. One company was sent to Alaska before we shipped out. 
Later on, we picked up one company from C Company, but this was after the war broke out. Then we went up uh, through Lingai and they set the Italian maintenance up at uh, Hermosa and the tanks, the company <coughs> of tanks, A Company, went on up to set, establish a line. And it was the Agno River. And uh, the Japs. Uh, moved in there at that time and started the firing mortars. We had one man killed in action. There was trouble. A mortar lit in a tree right over the tank. <coughs> he was standing with his head out of the tour talking to Colonel Miller. Then we had another tank that got a mortar shell right on the top of the engine calling. Knocked the top part off of the engine, that's the cylinder. Right magneto, oil pump. They managed to drive that the seven or nine miles back to Hermosa where we were set up at. Ed Burke, Major Burke, who was company commander, Captain Burke at that time was company commander of A Company. He was badly wounded, and then Japs got him, took him prisoner. And two fellas, Bell and Bender. Bender was wounded, <coughs> and Bell was there standing guard, and he refused to come on out, see. Bell, as I understood, was critically wounded, almost dead. So they disappeared, and I haven't heard where those two men, whether they got one or both of them were killed in action or not. But our next stop was on the withdrawal was down below Hermosa, where Miller set up a tank trap to get them when they were coming down. You see, we were covering the withdrawal in a delaying action. That was the general objective of the tanks there all the time in the front. We were to cover the withdrawal and stop the Japs from moving down. Oh, by the way, the, other, the withdrawal, I almost forgot an important part there. The withdrawal from uh, the Agnel River action when the tanks were coming back, Miller was back at the Agnel River. And some of the engineers had the explosives set on this bridge. And he was there to keep them from blowing the bridge till he got these tanks back across his head. Well, somehow or another, they slipped up on Miller and blew that damn bridge. The engineers did? Yeah. We lost 17 tanks. One company. I think that was shortly, and then after that we got C Company from the uh, 192nd Tank Battalion, which came in from Kentucky, Illinois, and various places to the east, came in about a month later, and we did. And I think that's when they assigned D Company to the 194th. Anyway, we moved on back. I set up battalion maintenance at uh, Clark Air Base. And the battalion, the balance of the company, then made fleet frog jumps back all the way from Hermoso back to Clark Field. At that time, we were ordered to. I was ordered to move the battalion maintenance back to the mouth of a ton, which I did. Uh, on the way down there, we were just about to go through a little town, and I never can think of the way, midpoint between San Fernando and Orano, down at the mouth of a ton. 
and uh, I saw the dive bombers coming out, so I flagged the uh, convoy down. We all hit the gates, but they didn't come down straight on us. We were made lucky that they didn't come down and release their bombs because we only had about a five or six truck convoy there composed of the three company maintenance sections and the battalion maintenance. They went over the top of us. We're about a quarter of a mile. No, we were less than a quarter of a mile out of that one town. They were after an ammunition train. Evidently, that's where the weird rail line stopped going down in the town. And they got a lucky hit with one bomb in there. And they hit the ammunition. That exploded. There was bombs and everything else loaded in there. <coughs> well, it practically wiped that little village out. We had to move on through. There was people laying all over the street, dead from the explosion, which the railroad track run right beside the road. There was nothing we could do. We had to get out of there and get where we could get cover for this. If I'd have lost that battalion maintenance, I'd have really been in the soup. So we kept on going. We moved through there. And I don't know to this day how many people were actually killed. They were just laying all over the street. Mm. The bus was that severe. It took all the buildings out that was along the railroad track. There wasn't a building standing. And uh, I thought after I left there, my God, he's lucky I wasn't pulling through there at the time they came down the bomb. So we lost everything. Anyway, we made our uh, withdrawal back down into Baton just the mouth of Baton, where you enter the Baton area. You, know, you can see uh, Manila Bay, where our road was there. We got in there, and the tanks got back to the mouth of Baton. They went up a hill. The road was a kind of a 90, about 120 degree V that they went up. And now we sat there for, oh, I guess about four days. The Japs, I suppose, recouped and we got their forces together again before they came down. And the tanks were quite a ways on the hill. <coughs> I went up. Uh, the road then make a reconnaissance see if we could get through artillery fire because it was time for maintenance on the tanks, loops and everything else. I don't want to turn up that road with our half ton pickup and Red Schultz was with me again. <laughs> First artillery blast came in, hit right in front of my truck about oh, 100 feet. I says, get off of the road, get under the tree, they're going to shell us. We went over the hill into a ravine there, and they laid down a carpet shelling all day. I came out of there just about sundown. I walked on up to where I knew the tanks to be, and told Miller I couldn't possibly bring the trucks in there. He says, that's all right. We're coming out later tonight. We'll uh, get them on this mountain mount. Uh, I can't remember the name of the mountain base of it. Anyway, the 31st, the uh, Japs had moved down in the meantime after shelling. 31st Infantry had to break and leave. Miller come out under fire with the tanks, and they got out of it with no loss, no casualties. They're pretty lucky. <coughs> Wait a minute. I think the Jap managed to get one thermal bomb on one of the tanks. Now, this is something that they Clamp on Clamp to onto it. it. Yeah, on the top deck. See, they had a flat top deck and then the turret. And that melted down through the engine, down through the armor, into the ammunition trays back there. And the boys had to abandon that tank. I went up to see if I could reach it before the Japs got to it, but they had already moved past it, you know, and they set the secondary line up about, 
I would say it was five, eight miles. They set the secondary line up there. And we pulled out <coughs> to that mountain. And of course, the maintenance uh, began to service all the tanks. They brought the scouts, the Filipino scouts, in about that time to cover that line up there. And they were a good soldier. Excellent. The Filipinos have been inducted into the service. Hadn't had time. They just started the draft year. And uh, didn't have much training. Most of them had American uniforms. American guns in the Springfields. Not the Duran. We all had Durans, but they didn't. And of course, they didn't have much fighting spirit. But the Filipino scout was one of the toughest fighters that you ever saw. Anyway, we held that line until somewhere around the middle of January before they finally broke it. And we moved back to what was called the Pilar Bay Act. Line. We moved maintenance back into a bamboo jungle back there <coughs> where we set up. No, we went to Pan and Point where we set up for beach defense you know, in case they came across Manila Bay in there. And that line held till about two, two weeks week and a half before surrender, we were able to hold that line. I recall we set up a beach defense. Evidently, it was a Jap gunboat came out there, and there was a large sunken freighter there, top exposed. He came in behind that freighter, and he started firing, and the shells, of course, were going over our head. I don't know what he was shooting at. Then the uh, Filipinos with their 75s started firing. They were just below us on the beach. And they started firing, and I heard the white captain, who was white captain, of course, they had their first shell flying way out in Manila, and he yelled, Hey, what the hell are you shooting at, Mars? <laughs> 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 yeah, I could hear him clear up there. Then the machine guns opened up. Couldn't see too far out in the bay, and finally I fired a rocket out there to see what was going on in our area. <coughs> there was actually nothing in there coming in, as far as I'm concerned. I, there was nothing out there. But I did pull a fool trick, because the wind was coming off of Manila Bay, drifting right our way when I fired that parachute rocket. It began to drift over our way, too, as well as light in the bay up. Of course, it light. drifted right over the point and <laughs> lit us all up. Oh, my God. <laughs> but luckily, there was nothing out there, you know. They did have uh, <coughs> several shells from that ordeal land up there in the hills, but they got no damage. And how he ever got out of there, I don't know, but... Uh, he got in, so he must have got out all right. I didn't hear any report that the artillery had sunk him offshore there. <laughs> then on about the 21st of April, when all out offensive began. Of course, one thing we did have is the Air Force, their uh, zeros, and their ready bombers. They had taken Clark Field and Nichols Field and the various sub-airfields uh, they had scattered around Luzon. They were working this over every day, like I told you when we began, there was no front line. Everything they saw move, they were after. So we had a lot of bombs coming down our throats, but fortunately not too many casualties. Some uh, flesh wounds, you know, fragmentation wounds, things like that. Were you, uh, were you actually doing maintenance at this time? Was there anything to 
oh, yes. maintain at this time? They brought the tanks back from uh, the front to be uh, checked over, to be maintained. We didn't have many parts. Understand uh, the Quartermaster Corps, the Ordnance Department, didn't get really the parts out of Manila. There was some dither on that. Before the war, for years, the old orange plan was set up where the withdrawal was planned to be made down into Bataan, see, and all supplies and everything was supposed to be shipped over there. Well, about a year before, six months before, MacArthur canceled out the orange plan, thinking, I guess, that he could hold the Philippines without uh, withdrawing into Bataan. That's where he thought wrong even though he was a hell of a good strategist. Uh, he made goose just like everybody does. So nothing had really been reverted to on the plan until oh, pretty close to the middle or last December when they decided to make an overall withdrawal in the baton. In the meantime, the Japs were hitting Manila so heavy with bombs that uh, MacArthur declared it an open city. That meant evacuation immediately of all troops. So all of this flies practically, our ordnance supplies for the tanks and our trucks and so forth were left in Manila. We had to uh, rob Peter to pay Paul, so to put it, in uh, keeping the equipment running. But when the Japs did come down against us, on that final, well, our back yak line, the line broke. Of course, the Japanese had shipped crack troops back up from uh, Singapore, troops that had fought from China and fought their way down there and took Singapore. They had to come back because the troops that were in the Philippines at that time were just as bad off as we are. They were loaded with malaria, mm -hmm. no quinine. <coughs> And I don't think they had too much food supply. So they were weak. They couldn't, they tried several times to penetrate the Pilar Bagyak line, but we always drove them back. So they sent the, the crack troops in from Singapore and all in the southern area, probably some down from Japan, I don't know. And uh, their original plan was, as I understand it, was to have the Philippines by Christmas time. Well, we delayed them three months before they got it. Well, that helped the war effort. If it did nothing more, it helped the war effort to radio by delaying their advance south southward. Otherwise, they may have taken Australia. We, by that time, had a lot of troops over in Australia, you know. But when that line broke, from there on out, there was nothing but chaos. I pulled a uh, maintenance and transportation platoon across a little mountain trail that I thought we would never get through, but we did. We couldn't go down the road. Too many troops withdraw and everyone down to the end of a ton. There was no organization after assembly of troops to form a line or anything except the tanks themselves. The tanks were able to uh, slow the Japs up. That's the best you can say for it. We lost, uh, I think in that deal, we lost three tanks in there, but luckily, no kill. There was a couple of men that were wounded, but minor wounds. You know, when you hit a tank with an artillery shell, you got armor. Just like uh, glass points. Coming the inside the tank. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. And we surrendered on April the 9th. We pushed the tanks down to the end of that point that we went to, just uh, a little above Mar Velas. There's a point that goes out toward Craigot. We filled them up with gas, and they were told to put them down there and burn them. The trucks 
we kept as a standby because we didn't know just what was going to happen. The Japs came in the next morning about 10 o'clock. We were there all night. Oh, by the way, in the meantime, we had one good snappy earthquake over there. The ammunition, I think the ammunition dumps may have set it off. I don't know. They were blowing ammunition that night. We got down in the end of the town. Everything was gone. Because the order had already come out that we would surrender. And, uh, Anyway, we kept those trucks available. Then the Japs came the following morning. There was a colonel and a couple of privates, about all just three of them come in. They were petty little devils. I wouldn't have cared to walk back in amongst the enemy forces that way with just three. Anyway, they came in. They promised Colonel Miller that if he had the trucks, they would get a ride out of there, back up in, out of the war zone. It's okay, we kept the trucks. <laughs> Should have known better than believe me. Anyway, pretty soon they came in that evening and they marched us up to the road. Drivers came in and got in the trucks and drove off. We were set there with two jam guards, their machine guns set up on tripods. We were across the road, all lined up in a column of four, setting down. And they were playing with these machine guns on the scene. Kind of thought, well, maybe this is going to be it. But it wasn't. These Jap guards searched all of us, you know, took everything they got. And they got canned heat. And two machine guns. Well, there was four of them actually there. <coughs> Two machine gun operators opened their cans of heat and started to eat them. When the change of guard came around, he saw they were just out of their head, drunk, you know. They took them. This was up against two, about two foot clearance. And there we got in that big thing. We started to bring out a puffed wheat of all things over there. You know the white puffed wheat? And then we found the sugar, and we we're bringing out sugar too. And this, I told Mike, I says, you know, they're going to see this, and there's going to be a rat race, and somebody's going to get hooked up on it. And uh, sure enough, it started to become a rat race. And I told Mike, I says, no, we're not going there anymore. You can if you want to, but I'm not. So these two Englishmen, no, they were Aussie, Aussies. They were over in that other barracks. One of them got over underneath and went over there, and the other one stood on this side. And that Aussie crawled up that fence, which he could on the other side, you know. He dumped a hundred pound bag of sugar down to the Aussie on this side, started across the compound with it on his shoulder, and the Jap guard come out from behind the building and caught it. <laughs> <laughs> they had a stockade in the compound. They threw them in there, give them a handful of rice a day, but they just loaded it with salt. That's what he had. Oh, boy. <laughs> For a week. He just couldn't eat because he didn't have any water. <laughs> As, a, as an officer of POW, then you were with other officers, and were there <coughs> not only Americans, but officers also? Australians and Indians. There are some that came from Singapore, some that came down in the islands there. Were there, were there any, under uh, circumstances like this, uh, obviously as, as bad as it was, were there a lot of tensions among the men, among the prisoners? that you remember? No. Oh, okay. no. Going back and reviewing it, Camp Adano, and also at uh, Camp Tabana Juan, I think there was more a spirit of helping than a spirit of survival. 
I never saw any tension amongst any of the enlisted men or any of the officers. Now, maybe some of the other boys did, but I didn't. And I didn't see any feeling amongst the men against the officers there either. So that was kind of unusual, but that's the way it was. Just a feeling of, a mixed feeling of cooperation, of survival, and getting out of the dang gun place. What about when you were in Japan? Well, I guess conditions weren't quite as bad as they were in no, the Philippines. No, they weren't. No, there was no problems amongst the officers or men. Hmm. Yeah. It seemed to me that a bunch of men caged together under very bad circumstances, tempers might have flared or... Oh, know, they probably had arguments. Yeah. But nothing severe into the fist fights or anything like that. No and killing. Plus being completely idle like yeah. that. I mean, that would be... I guess on these uh, ships coming up, in the later years there, why there was savagery on that ship, on these ships that came up and brought prisoners. I understand, from what I understand, that they were actually killing some prisoners, were killing other prisoners, drinking their blood, and et cetera, and et cetera. But I have no verification of that. But I could well see where it might happen when you get in a hold 120 degrees, you know. But uh, the Jap guards themselves give you the impression that you better not go too far with anything because they weren't going to tolerate it. In other words, we know they would have executed you mm -hmm. right away. So I think that put a lot of restraint on the men themselves not to get too involved. What kinds of things uh, say you were in Japan most of the time. What kinds of things did you do to keep busy or to keep your minds occupied? Or well, as far as I'm concerned, okay. what I did, the uh, officers come in from Guam and the other islands that I mentioned down there. They were taken, you know, before Christmas of 1941. And the Japs allowed them to bring books and things into camp, so... After I recovered in Zansuji, then there was about, uh, this is uh, 1943, yeah, 42, we said, 43. It had been the middle of that summer, or possibly in September, when I was able to focus my eyes again and could read and study and I could walk pretty good and everything. I started picking up these books and studying, mostly in accounting, uh, mathematics. I went on up through the higher mathematics there. And I kept myself busy on that. It was interesting when you had nothing else to do, you see. The rest of the fellows, I don't know, they sit around and chat. Some of them read some of the books that were there, they'd read and play cards. We did have playing cards that were smuggled in, of course, the Japs didn't supply us with anything. It wasn't until, I'd say in 44, it's difficult to recall, before we ever received any mail or any Red Cross boxes. Then they started to loosen up, I think. Two years before you got anything. Yeah. I think at that time they began to realize, I think every man in the uniform realized they were actually losing the war. How, how long can you kid any one man when you're continually backing up? See? They weren't kidding us in the Philippines when we were backing up that we weren't going to lose that skirmish now. So when you were moved to Japan, you figured something was going on. They were yeah, well, no, they talked to other though, soldiers that come back to the hospital and other troops that went back to the front and they were way back up toward Japan. I'm sure they began to get suspicious of the fact that they weren't 
Well, we didn't have a war. Did you have any information whatsoever about what, how the war was going on or anything like that? Oh, yes. We get the black market. A after we got in San Suji, we managed to leave a black market in this place. Hmm. Except guards would bring them in to us and we paid them. And we, they paid us yen, not very much yen. And we were fussy with it because we thought it'd be no good at the end of the war. It'd be a, no value. So the guards were bribable. Oh, yes. Not the extent of getting me out of there, though. <laughs> <laughs> was there was there any kind of uh, organization among the officers on I mean, chain of command or? Um, oh yes, we had a camp commander, uh, both in command of the one and also up in Sensuji, and I suppose in the other camp I was in previous to that. I don't know, too damn sick. To know yeah. What was going on there. But. Uh, really didn't need a chain of command anymore to pass down the message the Japanese yeah. might want to deliver. Usually they pass their own message down to us by almost just how making a standard attention while it give us a long lecture. Mm -hmm. And I suppose you find through your interviews and travels that Everyone has a little different, little different. In their story sure. on the thing, so, and that's the way it was. I mean, every camp that the men were in had a different experience, a rougher treatment, uh, work detail much harder. But I think Cabana to Juan, not so much Camp O'Donnell, we were in Cabana to Juan quite a long time. And that's where they, lined us up, marked us off in squads of 10. And that's what they call the shooting squads. Mm. And if one man escaped out of that squad, the other 10 men would be taken out and shot. Does that sound reasonable to you? Sounds like a good way of controlling prisoners. It's damn effective. <laughs> well, one man escaped out of the first group of 10, they brought the other nine men down and they tied them to fence posts. And the guards there changed hour on the hour, not two hours like the Americans do. Hour on the hour, the guards changed. They took turns. Each time they came off of guards, they beat all nine of these prisoners with a club. Well, in one way, I guess it was a blessing condition them to want to die. And that went on for two days, and they were tied to these fence posts out in the sun, 24 hours a day. Then they made us walk up there and witness the firing squad shooting these boys. That happened twice in Cabana to one that I witnessed. We had to witness it. Two groups. One group had a Navy officer in it that escaped, and they caught the Navy officer. And he marched him through, out across the road, away from us. I didn't hear a gunfire. But they claimed that that was an honorable death by using their saber, beheading him. Mm -hmm. And they beheaded him because, I don't know what the reason was. <laughs> There wasn't any heroics in escaping when you knew that ten of your fellow, nine of your fellow men were going to die. And that's the thing that kept us from the escape. Also in Donald, it was the same way. We were divided up there. But they didn't take any equal number like ten. Mm -hmm. They might pull out a whole section. And, uh, of course, that was dropped when we got to Japan. They didn't bind us up in the 10 men shooting squad. Nothing said about that. Well, there wasn't anywhere to go, was there, when you That's were in Japan? Right. Huh? They weren't worried. <clears throat> We'd stand out like a sore thumb. Anything else you can think of well, that I might be able to recall? Just some concluding general questions. Um, 
when you uh, when you came back to this country, um, did you have much trouble adjusting to being back home? No, I didn't. I don't know. Some of the, well, I say quite a number of the boys did. Actually became alcoholics. Hmm. Captain Bird. Couldn't seem to forget that he was a major in the army. Hmm. And he was drinking. The more he drank, the more he talked about it. He finally passed away back in 60, sometime, with cancer. Eleanor cancer, something like that. I don't know what it was along that line. And we did have a lot of alcohol and stuff like that. Among the POWs, you mean? Yeah, the return from the company. Sid sign. Oh, I can't call her names off now, but they drank pretty heavy, see. Me, I didn't have time to drink. I, like a damn fool, instead of taking my 2020 pay, I had to get my business back on track. <laughs> and I went to work on that right away. So, did you, did you have any lasting um, bad physical effects from your, from your in, in prison? Yeah, with me, I think everyone did. Uh, well, Walt, for instance, he's loaded down with medication. I don't know what he knew that. Mm -hmm. Oh, he still, he talks about the thing quite a bit, but... Uh, he goes to St. Cloud every two or three weeks, four weeks. And just loaded down the medication now. Henry, he's another breed of character. Henry never went into the VA up until the time he retired. So evidently he was pretty healthy. I was all right till about 1947. Then I started to get the gastrointestinal problems. Oh boy, I just cramp up right and nothing slam. I up walking the floor many nights. I went all through the 50s and the 60s, but I kept going. I didn't stop because of it. Jesus, that was painful. And I went. Down to the VA, time and time again, nothing was done. So I began to lose respect for the VA at that time. And then uh, I come to find out years later, and I only figured it out mostly by myself, was that uh, I shouldn't have been taking all the stress. It was added to the stress we had, you know, every prisoner of war, I'm sure, was under heavy stress there because you didn't know when you were going to be dead, whether you are going to be alive or dead by sundown or sun up either way. And finally I decided to get out of business. And I joined the corporation down in Minneapolis there, Harris Brothers. Well, that helped a great deal, I guess, with this gastrointestinal problem. Then I did wind up in the uh, Robinsdale Medical Center there with cramps so violent that uh, I just couldn't go out for work. My wife and my older son took me over there and they did the x-ray jobs. Now, mind you, I'd been going to the VA all these years once a month, anyhow. And they found this to add the ulcer, which mm -hmm. I still have today. The VA should have then found it easily. But they didn't. And uh, 
after that, then I began to gain control of the feelings and everything. If I had a problem, I just walked away from it, came back at a later time to solve it, just get away from the stress. Then I came along pretty good. Did you have anything like, or still, nightmares or oh, yeah, things yeah. of this kind? Oh, yeah, yeah. still dream. Yeah. You don't get rid of them. I think you dream about them every once in a while. You drop into a dream. Especially when you got some anxiety or something hanging over your head about something, you know, or you get into too much stress again, you, you start to renewing old dreams. But I don't really let them bother me anymore. Eh? When I wake up, I will wipe them right out of my mind. I don't even think about them. I know I had a dream. I wasn't interested. <laughs> That's a good way to do it. <laughs> well, you feel a lot better by doing it. Yeah. Do you have any, any real anger and resentments about about that period in your life? In other words, do you, do you think that the government country just let you down or no I never felt that way I knew that we weren't prepared I knew what the trouble the government was having and all the people unemployed starting back in 32 when Roosevelt took office he had to get them to work with the works progress administration WPA and the various other organizations, the CCC camps, and I don't know how, how many different organizations he had going. And at the same time, in that period, we had a very conservative Congress. A uh, hell of a lot of the congressmen were all uh, farmers, conservative. I know Roosevelt was having trouble getting the National Defense Bill. I remember that day. It was just a no-no, no draft. He even had to run on the platform the basis that he wouldn't send American troops overseas when he knew he was going to have to do it or lose England. Because by that time, Hitler was becoming very powerful. And I had that feeling we were going into and I had the feeling that uh, a lot of these programs that he was carrying on at that time, and I can remember that clearly. Instead of carrying on these useless programs, start building up the national defense. Same money. We'd have been far more supplied. Put the people back to work? Yeah. <coughs> when you start building up the military force, you put a lot of people to work. You believe that. But he couldn't do it because Congress had dead set that it would not get involved in a war. Then they got our can clip for that. Did so, you, uh, hmm? Go ahead. I, I lost my question just as I was putting it. I'm sorry, go ahead. I interfered there. <laughs> um, did any. Now, through all that hell that you went, went through for three and a half years, can you remotely think that there was anything from that experience that had a positive effect on you in any way? How you thought about things, uh, confidence in yourself, or I don't know exactly how to put it, but was, was there anything to be salvaged from that experience? It was three and a half awful years. No, I can't say that I can think of anything that uh, in those three and a half years. Well, I'll go back and say one thing. I do know that if you get sick, you've got to help yourself. You've got to do it mentally if you haven't got anybody else to do it for you. You have to do that mentally, and that's a big power in healing. That's the way I feel about it. Whether it's correct or not correct, it proved correct for me. Uh, but otherwise, uh, what 
could you accomplish? What could you salvage in it? You saw death, you saw bloated bodies, you starved to death. You were threatened with bayonets, you were threatened with bullets. think of anything outside of the fact that the main thing that I learned is by Davis uh, never let our national defense down again. And that's been in my mind ever since that time. Of course, times are changing. Population's changing. Younger people don't know what can really happen because we have lived in a free world for 215 years, I guess, 14 years. And so the younger generation don't know what it is. Did you have any resentment when you came back? I mean, you must, coming back to Bren, you must have known some men who didn't have to go. How did you no, feel about I, that? Did you have any feelings about that at all? I really didn't. You really didn't? No, I didn't. If they had a job, were working, and everybody that I knew that had a deferral yeah. was, work was working in an important job. And I had no resentment about that at all. If it had been the Vietnam era, I imagine they'd come back here just as bitter as some of the other Vietnam veterans among the boys that took off for Canada and refused to fight. All that garbage. Uh, maybe they had their reason, I don't know, but uh, I'm not going to be the judge. I'm going to let history judge those boys. <laughs> One final question, and I'll let you go. When you came home, did you feel that your sacrifice had been appreciated? Or did that bother you? I never really give it a never second thought. No, I didn't. When I came home, I was interested in getting going back into business and getting making money. <laughs> That's about it. Making up the three and a half, four years. Yeah, trying to catch up, but I never did quite make it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I never.